right, so let's just get started with the material then. So how many of you would say that you're fairly strong writers? Wow, that's a <laughs> How many of you would say that you struggle a little bit with writing? Okay, yeah, and honestly, and that's everybody struggles with writing, right? Writing is a struggle. Writing is difficult, right? Good writing is not easy for anyone. And the first thing that I want everybody to get into their heads here, right, as we embark on this material, is that like most other things worth doing, writing is a learned skill. Right? If you feel like you are bad at writing now, that doesn't mean that you are always going to be, quote unquote, bad at writing, right? Intelligence is not fixed at birth. Plenty of research shows that people can get better at things they don't think they're good at with practice and feedback. And so that's largely what this course is going to be about, right? There's going to be, you're going to do a lot of practice, right? There are a lot of small assignments, and you're going to get a lot of feedback, right? The goal being to make you more confident writers by the end of the course. Right, to improve those skills. Um, now, the first key to becoming a stronger, more confident writer, the first skill you really need to hone observation. You need to develop an eye for detail. And once you've got that, you can start making meaning out of details, right? So uh, let's start just with a quick little, uh, quick little introductory exercise. Um, you are, what is your name? Jackson. Jackson. I was actually pointing at her, but you, you'll do too. <laughs> okay, so Jackson, did you notice anything unusual on your way to class today? We were in the wrong room? Yeah, my schedule said 202, so I sat in there for like five minutes. Is this 201? Yeah. I'm pretty sure that they all, okay, so, the, so there was a misprint on your schedule, right? But okay, so let's sort of take this back to moments of observable detail moments here, right? Okay, so first, right, you went to class. You observed. that there was no one else in the room, right? So this led you to what conclusion? Well, there were, but they were American lit. Okay. <laughs> so it wasn't that there was no one else in the room, it was, it was the wrong people were in the room, right? So you noticed the wrong people in the room, and so your interpretation of the situation is? I need to leave. Yeah, I need to leave because I'm in the wrong place, right? We do these kinds of things all the time, right? but we rarely actually think about them and break them down and try to analyze our behavior and our responses, right? We're always responding to these kinds of stimuli in our environment. And what I'm asking you to do today, right, and for the rest of the term, I hope for the rest of your college career, is to really think hard about these kinds of moments. Now, um, your name was? Grace. Okay, Grace. So. What, did you notice anything unusual on your way to class today? Um, I did the same thing. You did the same thing he did? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, All right. A separate room. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let's try to Heather, what about you? Um, I noticed there were no elevators in the building. Okay. You noticed that there was no elevator in this building, right? Mm -hmm. So what conclusions can we draw from that? From the lack of an elevator? What conclusions about the building or the campus can we draw from the lack of an elevator? That the building must be old, right? 
Why must the building be old? Most buildings, and why do most buildings have an elevator? Exactly, right, because you're legally required to provide access for people with disabilities, right? So if this building doesn't have that, it must mean that it was built before that law was passed, right? So it's grandfathered in. Right? They keep telling us we're going to get an elevator, but we have yet to see it. So fingers crossed. OK. What I'd like you to do now right, is just look around the classroom. Take five minutes and just write down observations about the objects around you, the general condition of said objects, right? What things do you see? What kind of condition do they seem to be in? Um, and focus only on things that are actually part of the classroom. Right? Don't focus on things that any of us brought in with us. Just focus on the classroom itself, right? Take five minutes and tell me what you see. might be a good idea to start by listing as many objects as you can and then looking more closely at individual objects and making observations about them, right? Don't try to interpret anything yet, just make observations.
about one more minute. Okay, so what do you got? Yes? A stain. Okay, stained whiteboard, good. All right, what else? There's a circular dent in the floor. Okay, big old dent in the floor. Yes? Okay, yep, we have a broken pencil sharpener from back when people needed to sharpen pencils. Okay, good, what else you got? Yes? The paint is peeled up there. Okay, peeling paint. Great, good job, keep going guys, yes? The lines are messed up with the bottom. Okay, messed up lines. All right, keep them coming. <laughs> okay, well, you really did break down into minutia, didn't you? Okay, all right, so too many light fixtures. There's no clock. What's that? There's no clock. There, you're right, there is no clock. Dried up markers. Yeah, dried up, <laughs> up markers. Okay, yeah, office chair in the way. <laughs> Everything's the same color. Okay, and what color is that? None. What's that? Non-color. <laughs> Non-color, okay. <laughs> so, yeah. There's sort of one stripe of blue. Yeah, there's that weird stripe of blue up there, right? So, most of room is monochrome. One weird strike of blue. Did you say there's too many bears? Chairs. <laughs> okay. Yeah, more chairs than desks, right? There's trash on the desk around. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> more chairs than desks. Litter. I think there's a hip earring on the bulletin board. It's probably like a bracelet, a little binder. Oh, yeah, that could, yeah. People lose things. And that's. <laughs> There's two holes in the wall. Okay, holes in the wall. Man, we're uh. This sound great. I know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what a beautiful place this is. Okay, burnt out bulbs. <laughs> oh, what's that? Oh, yeah. I guess yeah. They, they they kept the lights going here. Yeah, that's that's <laughs> something. There's no spot for a lock on the inside of the door. Okay, no inside lock. Okay. Okay, vent and door. So I guess it'll be doing all suffocate. I don't know. <laughs> There's a non-projector for old Yeah, we got shiny new projector up here, right? Okay, what else? Anything else? Yeah, Nick. That camera has been in the same place since I took University 1002 semesters ago. This camera? Yeah. Oh. Well, yeah, that, that, that's mine. I just brought it in with me. Yeah. Uh, so I'm just talking about things that are intrinsic to the, like things that we didn't bring in. It's two whiteboards. Two whiteboards. Focusing on the negative here. 
Okay, is there anything else in the room that looks relatively shiny and new? Smoke detector, or motion detector. Okay, with the motion, the motion detector doesn't always work like it's supposed to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. The speakers? Yeah, we have speakers. The These are actually a little bit out of date. Yeah, the air conditioner usually works. <laughs> and we have a little smart cart with a computer here, right? That's what's behind uh, all, of, all of this. So I think we have enough here to work with, right? So what we can do now is we can try to use some of this information to draw conclusions about the room and about the department that uses the room, right? So we're going to start with a process that's called deductive reasoning, right? Does anybody know what I mean by deductive reasoning? What? You can come to a conclusion based on your observations? Uh, not quite. Essentially what deductive reasoning means is that we start with a general principle and then work our way down to specifics that demonstrate that principle, right? So you're working from the universal or the general to the particular. So the general principle that I want us to think about here is given the state of the room, how much does the university seem to value this department and what we do? And you know, focus on specific evidence here, right? Okay, and what, what in general suggests here, like just pick out a couple of things that, like a pattern here that suggests a relatively low level of importance. Nothing's updated. Yeah, everything, almost everything is old or in a state of disrepair, right? Or messy or unpainted or whatever, right? And you know, I'm, I'm not whining here. I do not, you know, take this as, as whining, right? This is just an observation exercise. You know, I'm not expecting all of you to go marching into Neil Weaver's office and demanding <laughs> updates to the English building. I do that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so is there anything in this set of information that doesn't fit that general pattern? Okay, yeah, all the lights are working. Right? That should be our bare minimum expectation, right? <laughs> that the lights in the AC stay on. Um, we got the projector, right? What else do we have in here that's relatively shiny and brand new? This whiteboard's not really shiny at all. It's pretty. That whiteboard's pretty. That whiteboard is absolutely is almost pristine, right? We'll talk about that in a minute. But what else? What's something that's sort of similar to the projector that we can sort of fit into the same pattern? Yeah, right? So we've got the projector and the smart cart, right? What do these things have in common? They're tech, right? Yeah. These are tech objects. So we have new shiny tech objects in the room, right? While the actual physical infrastructure around us is crumbling. So what does that <laughs> suggest about some sort of the relative values the university places on physical space, or like the direction they seem to want to go in. The technology is more important. Yeah, the, the, they'll put it, yeah, the tech is more important than the physical space, right? The tech is a sort of a kind of band aid over the crumb. It's like, well, you have these shiny new objects, right, that allow you to teach in new and unconventional ways, but you have to do so. And oh, and, hey, look! Even those windows back there are uneven, so the foundation's settling. That's 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 wonderful. <laughs> Great. Uh, we'll make it out alive. Um, so related to that, right? Now, Dylan made an observation here about the very very clean whiteboard that he is sitting next to. If we look at the way the room is set up, what kind of teaching style? is this room oriented towards? What, what, what kind of teaching style does the person who designed this room seem to expect in it, and what's your evidence? Yeah. Just using technology, because everything's pointing toward the 
Okay, yeah, all the tech points to the front, right? The projector points to the front, the smart card is up front. What about the desk? Like, would it even be easy for us to use that whiteboard? No, there's desks in the way. Yeah, there's desks in the way, and are these desks light and easily maneuverable? No. They're kind of heavy and clunky, right? So even if I wanted to set this classroom up in a different kind of way, it wouldn't be easy to do so, right? It would be noisy and kind of distracting. So if everything is oriented here towards the front, what kind of teaching style does that suggest um, is expected in here? So yeah, lecture style, right? Sage on the stage, right? So yeah, the room is built for lecture. And we figure, that, we figure these things out, right? Again, just sort of through observing these little details around us. Right. Okay, so we're going to try a little something else now, right? I'm going to ask you to take five minutes and just try to make as many observations as you can about me, about my appearance, about the sound of my voice, about you know the way I, you know the way I use my hands the way I move around the room, whatever, right? And, you know, don't worry about hurting my feelings, right? I'm a big boy, I can take it, so just be honest. Um, but yeah, I just want you to sit, take five minutes, and make as many observations as you can about me. Don't try to interpret, just make observations. To give you an example of the kind of thing I'm looking for, right? One of the first things someone always says is, you're married. Now, how would they know? because I'm wearing a ring on the ring finger of my left hand, right? That's the detail I want. I don't want the interpretation, right? So if you come up with anything that sounds like, oh, I'm interpreting, try to dial it back to the detail that led you to think that, okay? All right, so go ahead, get started. Yes. And this is just on how you look, not how you act. Oh, how I act too, yeah. Oh. Sure. Anything you've observed. As long as you can, you know, isolate it to a concrete detail, right?
Okay, what do you got? Yes? How can you tell? Okay, no southern accent, right? Right, that's the important detail there. Right, not from the south is an interpretation. Out of curiosity, like, where do you guys think I am from? <laughs> <Middle of nowhere. laughs> well, I'm actually. Um, how many of you watch The Office? Yeah. Okay, Scranton. Yeah. yeah, that's that's where I'm from. It, yeah, it, it it exists and it's just as awful as it appears on TV. <laughs> well, because you're right between New York and Philadelphia, and you're getting New York and Philadelphia TV channels, and you're always aware that some that things are more interesting two and a half hours away from you. <laughs> so yeah, that's great. Um, What's that? You look like Jesus from The Walking Dead. Okay, well, again, break that down, right? What about me makes me look like Jesus from The Walking Dead? The hair and the facial hair. Okay, so I have long hair and a beard, right? Okay. Right, break it down into concrete details. Sneakers and jeans. Okay, I'm wearing sneakers and jeans. What a collared shirt. <laughs> yep, okay, sneakers, jeans, collared shirt. Collared All right. Design. Collar is undone. Okay, good. What else you got? Okay, paces. T-shirt under collared shirt. Okay, T-shirt under collared shirt. Yes, I'm wearing a belt. Okay. Okay. What's casual about my tone? Okay, I swear. All right, I gave you fair warning about that. Sarcastic. Um, What's that? Okay. All right, what else you got? Yeah, I'm a staring contest champion. Yeah. <laughs> Makes eye contact. I said hand on hand when writing. Okay, yeah. Yeah, no, I do that, yeah. I'm doing it right now. <laughs> what else? Do you like for people to give you feedback when you're talking to them? Okay, how can you tell? Like, you told us to participate in class, like, ask questions and things like that. Okay, right, so you know, I, you know I want feedback from you because I ask for it, right? Okay, yeah. Okay, good, all right. Okay, yeah. Reports class. Your hair is brushed. Okay. <laughs> hair is long, but is brushed. Okay. Not totally unkempt. What else? You've got a pen in your left pocket, but you're writing with your right. Okay. It's weird. That you keep a writing very utensil very on the opposite side of your body with which you write. Okay, pen is in left pocket, but is right-handed, okay. All right, one or two more, what else you got? Enjoy teaching. How can you tell? Because you take the time to record the class, that's what I do. You're enthusiastic about it. Okay. Like you don't want your students to be unsuccessful. Okay, but again, yeah, sort of dial that back to specific impressions, right? And problem solve in order to Okay, yeah, okay, I, I offered solutions to those who can't find the book right away, right? Yes. Which suggests that I care about you at least having access to the material. Okay, so yeah, see that, that's the kind of thing I'm asking you for, right? Yeah. Try to draw it, yeah, bring everything back down to some concrete detail. So what I'd like you to do with this set of information we've got here now, if you can read it, um, given, you know, my shitty handwriting and the dryness of the marker, uh, what I would like you to do is sort of look for patterns in here that tell you something you think about what kind of person or what kind of teacher I am. Yeah, Garrett. You're informal, but not too informal. Okay, uh, and give me uh, some justification for that. You're wearing sneakers and jeans, but like your shirt's still tucked in with a button up. Okay, so by looking at the way I dress, you can tell that I'm comfortable with a certain level of informality but I'm not 
willing to go full slob, right? Okay. All right, good, what else? You're a passionate teacher. Okay, again, justify. Justification? Yeah. Like you said, you asked for feedback, you record uh -huh. the class sessions, post them on YouTube, you're here yeah. for us to learn. And you were here early. Okay, I was here early, there yes. You know, that's a good point. Offer a solution to the problem that wouldn't be your problem. So yeah, the textbook isn't my problem. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it, it is my problem if nobody's doing the assignments. I, well, I guess it's not, but. Um, okay, what else? Give me, uh, give me something else here. Going along with being a passionate teacher, you care about the success of your students because, like, because you are offering the solution, you are recording the class and asking, and asking for feedback, asking for our participation. Okay, um, you know, this, 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 this is all very nice. And you know, like, I feel very flattered by much of this. But how about if you can find something negative in here? Like something that suggests discomfort, you know, so some sort of deep, dark, dark, vicious secret. Like some people don't like people, other people being sarcastic. Like some people get very offended by that. Okay, so the fact that my tone is so casual and blunt suggests that I don't give a shit if I offend you or not. Okay. You don't seem very religious. Okay, why not? Because um, you freely cuss. Okay. Okay. Guilty, yeah. You don't care what anybody thinks. Yeah. Like, tell us if we don't like how you speak, then just go ahead and go to a different teacher. Mm -hmm. Or even how you speak with your hair. <laughs> no, no, no concern for society standards. <laughs> yeah, Nick. Um, you've been teaching for quite a while. So okay. Your casualness. Okay. How, what other details suggest that I've been teaching a long time? I would say the hand on the hip. Okay, the hand on the hip. Preparation. Okay, the level of preparation. Like I have all of this stuff laid out, right? When I I was here early. You know, like answering questions before we even ask. Okay. <laughs> I already I already know what a lot of you are going to say because we've been here before. Yeah. Like you know how to dress comfortably because you know you'll be standing in teaching like most of the whole time. And the eye contact thing. A lot of like new teachers don't really do that. Like mm -hmm. if they're a new professor, they just kind of like look and talk to students, but then they like kind of look around the room. Okay. You've taught enough yeah. to know the, to be able to like have enough material to change the syllabus around each semester. Yeah. Okay. And you've been in this classroom for a while because you noticed the window being uneven, which would be something that like you wouldn't notice just from. Uh, I've been st I've been staring at the space between those two windows for for six years. <laughs> it's only changed half an inch. Yeah, it's not it's not changing very fast, but <laughs> yeah, you know, foundations don't crumble right away. You know, at least you hope not. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so what I'd like to do now. So essentially, what we've done in a very small kind of way today is uh, what we call inductive reasoning, right? So if deductive reasoning means you start with a, with a general question or a general principle and work your way down to specifics, then logically, if inductive reasoning is the opposite, what does that mean? Specific to general. Exactly. You start with specific observations and you try to move from them to a general principle or a general argument, right? So most of the kind of thinking we're going to be doing in this class, most of the kind of thinking you're going to be doing in most of your classes is going to be inductive, right? You're going to be given sets of data and asked to come up with some kind of argument about them, right? Or to explain them in some way. So we're going to focus a lot more of our time on this kind of inductive logic. It's going to be inductive reasoning. Now, <clears throat> the homework assignment that you're doing for Thursday is going to be a kind of inductive reasoning assignment. Right? Did everybody get the email that I sent with the three images? OK, you're going to choose one of those right, to work from. And What you're going to do is a process very similar to what we just did, right? I want you to start by breaking down the image 
into parts, right? Making concrete observations about things you see in the image. And then you are going to come up with some kind of interpretation of the image, right? What does this image mean? What is it doing, right? Why is it set up in this way, right? What kind of arguments can I make about this image? So part one, right? You're just gonna give me your observations and the conclusions that they lead you to draw. And if you want a model for that, if you look in the first chapter of writing analytically, there is um, somewhere. somewhere in here, yeah. There's a bit where they're, they're looking at a painting, Whistler's mother. Maybe it's not in this chapter. Well, anyway, they're looking at a painting, Whistler's mother. And should be on page 35. It looks like this, right? They're mapping out the observations they make about the painting and the conclusions they draw about it, right? This is the kind of thing I want you to do. Why is that not here? Huh, weirdly, that page seems to be missing. OK. The rest of it's there, I promise. Now the second. Yes, you're going to turn those in in Georgia View. There is a folder for each assignment, and they're all labeled and in order, right? So the first four things you're going to be turning in for this class, right, should be the first four folders that appear in Georgia View, and you will not be able to upload it until it opens. It should have opened today, so you should be able to do it today and upload it. Now part two. You are going to explain your interpretation of the image in 250 words. And to give you an example of what I want you doing, right, we're going to take a quick look at a painting and I'm going to demonstrate this for you, right? And you are going to try to do the same thing with one of the images that I have given to you. Okay, here we go. Yes? So this has to be typed? Yeah, this will need to be, uh, to be typed. Yes? Um, so where can we find the first two chapters of the book for the assignments? Um, I have the first chapter of the book for you here. Um, if you also need the second chapter of the book, I'll give that to you on Thursday. But yeah, we're kind of just going to do this on like a day-by-day -day basis. So when I'm letting you go, let me know if you need a copy of the first chapter of the book and I will give it to you. But remember, like, after this week, you're going to have to get one yourself somehow. And if you need my help to do that, then just, you know, just let me know. Okay, so this image um, is a painting. It's part of a, a larger mural by the Mexican painter Diego Rivera. And it's called The Intellectuals. So what we see here first and most obviously, right, are two groups of people, right? One group in the foreground and one group in the background. And it kind of looks like the foreground group are inside a room that the background group are looking into, right? There's a frame here that this group seems to be behind. Now, if we look at the group in the background, we see what kind of clothes are they wearing? Work clothes. Work clothes, right? They're, you know, sombreros, work hats, uh, you know, work shirts, right? What about the sorts of things, that, the objects they're carrying? Yeah, we got a hammer. One guy's got a gun. 
Another guy's got a sheaf of wheat, right? So we have a combination of tools and weapons, right? They're also all wearing bullets, you know, like bullet straps. Now, if we look at these figures in the foreground, what kind of objects do we see them holding? Okay, yeah, this, this one guy is strumming a harp, right? Yep, this guy is holding a quill pen. Yeah, this wizard looking guy in the middle has a funnel on his head and looks like he's holding up a wand, right? And this guy's sitting on a pile of books. What's that? Yeah, this guy's sitting on a sculpture of an elephant. And the woman who's throwing her head back and singing is sitting on him, right? She's leaning on him. So one of the first things we want to do here is examine the relationships between the figures in the image and then think about their relationship to the audience, right? If we look at the figures in the background, where are their, where's their attention directed? At the people in the foreground, right? They are looking at the people in the foreground. And what do the expressions on their faces and the things they're carrying suggest about their attitude towards the people in the foreground? Pardon? Yeah, they don't like them, right? Hostile, malicious, right? Yeah, their, their intent towards these people is not kind. Now, what about the people in the foreground? By and large, what are they looking at? Well, is anybody actually looking at him except for these guys? He's looking at us, right? What about this guy, this guy, her, and him? Yeah, none of them are looking at anyone, right? They're kind of wrapped up and they're like, this, this guy's got his eyes closed. She's got her eyes half closed and she's looking up at the sky. His back to us and his eyes are concealed and he's looking down, right? So each of these figures, whom we can assume are artists or intellectuals as opposed to workers, right? Given one, the title of the painting, and two, the objects associated with them. They're all off in their own little worlds, right? And they don't see the threat from the workers behind them coming. So on the one hand, the figures in the foreground look pretty ridiculous, right? They're silly, ineffectual, not paying any attention to the world around them. But the only fig who's the only figure in the painting who's engaging with us at all? The guy, sorry. The guy in the middle, right? The most ridiculous looking figure in the whole fucking painting, right? Is the only guy who's making eye contact with the viewer. So what this suggests, right? The interpretation I would then draw of this painting is that while it does seem to make the intellectuals in their pursuits look ridiculous, at the same time, on a certain level, it values that silliness and that ridiculousness as an essential human quality. That while it's clear that the workers are going to win here, right, these idiots don't stand a chance against them. At the same time, something valuable is lost when these sort of creators and curators of learning and culture are destroyed. Even if they do wear funnels on their heads. Okay, so that's just my brief interpretation of a single image, right? So what I want you to do is try to do something similar with the image you choose, right? And it has to be one of the three images from the email. Right? Don't, pick, don't go off and pick something on your own. Right? Pick something that I gave you. All right, any questions? I'm not sure I got it. Pardon? I'm not sure I got it. Okay, um, shoot, can you shoot me an email to remind me to send it to you again? All right. All right, um, and that's that. If you need a copy of the uh, first chapter writing analytically, come see me. 
Also, make sure that you leave the little info sheet that I had you fill out at the beginning of class um, on the front table here.